Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Breast Cancer Care During COVID-19. My name is Michelle Dixon, and I am the Program and Development Director for Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I am very pleased to welcome back today's speaker, Dr. Michael Misalek. Dr. Misalek serves as the Associate Chair of Pathology at Newton Wellesley Hospital. He is the Medical Director of the Vernon Cancer Center Chemistry Laboratory and Point of Care Testing. He holds an academic appointment at Tufts University School of Medicine, where he is regularly instructs medical students and pathology residents. Dr. Misalek is a strong advocate for pathology and is very active in the College of American Pathologists, where he is an inspector and has conducted numerous hospital laboratory inspections, both nationally and internationally. He received his MD from the University of Massachusetts, completed his residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and did a fellowship in general surgical pathology at the University of Florida. He is board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology. Dr. Misalek also serves as MBCC's medical advisor. Dr. Misalek, welcome. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Thank you all for registering, and I hope the next hour is uh, informative, and I'll try and uh, get through it in 50 minutes or so, so that we can leave a few minutes for questions, uh, if anybody has questions. So what I want to talk about is breast cancer care during the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic and a brief outline of uh, what we'll be talking about today. I want to spend a few minutes just going over some basics about coronavirus, uh, the illness it causes, the different uh, symptoms and organ systems that it, it affects, uh, what happened during the first surge during the beginning of the year in the winter and spring uh, as a lead into a case presentation of a breast cancer patient, uh, how that a patient was handled in the midst of a pandemic and what we learned from that and what we uh, hope to uh, gain from that knowledge as we go forward entering here a second surge and uh, what 2021 might bring. So just to briefly review the coronavirus, it's a uh, molecule, I'm sure many of you have seen this image in the media. Uh, it's a, a RNA type virus. The uh, genetic material is portrayed here on the right side of the screen. It's a coil of RNA in this shell of protein with the spike proteins. And the spike protein is what is used to attach to uh, cells and infect cells and turn them into virus making machines, pumping out more coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus affects virtually every organ system in the body, uh, including the skin. Uh, neurologically, it can cause headaches, dizziness, encephalopathy, uh, even strokes. One common theme among a lot of these injuries is that coronavirus, uh, as its basic mechanism of action, appears to affect the blood vessels, the lining of the blood vessel called the endothelial cells. And in so doing, it can create a hypercoagulable state, meaning patients are more likely to clot. And you'll recognize that many of these injuries here are because of clots, uh, small clots within the vessels, such as a stroke, or in the kidneys might have a little renal in in infarct causing injury and spilling of protein or blood into the urine. Uh, equally as such, in the uh, liver, there can be elevated enzymes. Your liver function test could be elevated. Uh, GI tract, we know that coronavirus affects uh, the, the lining of the GI tract can cause diarrhea. In fact, a significant proportion of patients that we do see have some GI symptoms and a smaller fraction may only manifest with GI symptoms. Uh, thromboembolism, so uh, in, infarcts, thrombi, within the deep vein vessels of the legs or even in the lungs uh, can be a presenting symptom as well. We're 
just now elucidating some of the effects on the heart. Uh, inflammation within the heart called myocarditis can uh, uh, propagate arrhythmias and cause uh, heart defects as well. The endocrine system, it can affect the pancreas and skin as well. Uh, many of you have heard of so-called COVID toes. What that is, is little infarcts, emboli with, within the small vessels of the skin causing uh, a, a rash, and we can see that in patients as well. This is an uh, update. I grabbed this off the dashboard of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Every day they update this with new numbers uh, at 5 p.m. This was yesterday at uh, Tuesday, 5 p.m. And you can see the first surge, uh, the highest number of daily counts was up to about 3,000. Uh, we, we began in mid-March, peaked in May, and dropped off over the summer, and over the past uh, several weeks have now been slowly climbing up, and surprisingly, uh, some of the case counts just in the past few weeks have surpassed those that we saw in, in the first surge. Uh, some of the modeling that we've done here internally uh, predicts that we, we may not have the volume of patients that we saw during the first surge, but we definitely are feeling an increase in uh, patients right now. Uh, here's, here's another interesting slide taken off the Department of Public Health website, is that the, the patient uh, demographic of those who've been infected by coronavirus has changed through the year. Uh, early in the year, here on the left side, uh, back in March, uh, we see a larger percentage of patients in the uh, older age group, older age group, so 80 years old, 70, 60. This uh, chunk of the population here was uh, disproportionately affected over younger patients, and I think many of you have realized that you've seen reports of uh, elderly patients in nursing homes really being hit hard during the first surge. Interestingly now, uh, as we're entering the second surge, the, the face of the patient is, is changing some. So uh, younger patients are uh, presenting more and more to the hospital. Uh, in fact, you'll see this age group zero to 19 has, has increased as well as 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and subsequently a, a lesser percentage of elderly patients. So we'll see how that plays out, what that means. Uh, is is something that we're learning every day, and uh, so what what happened during during the surge? Uh, March 10th, Governor Baker declared a state of emergency across the Commonwealth, and as such, many uh, voluntary uh, services with within the hospital got uh, shut down. Patients no longer. Uh, could come in for elective surgeries, other elective procedures. Uh, virtually overnight, patients with heart attacks, strokes, even appendicitis is banished from hospitals. Talking to some of my colleagues in cardiology, I remember back in the spring, uh, them commenting about the number of uh, heart attacks we had per month. It, it dropped more than a half virtually overnight. And uh, there were several articles in the press. Uh, a lot of literature has been written about this. Uh, patients just weren't coming to the hospital and were suffering with illnesses at home, uh, with heart attacks, strokes, uh, and, and not presenting to the hospital. And uh, in, in the worst cases, die, dying at home. Uh, here's a uh, graph taken from a recent journal of the American Medical Association article that shows different uh, conditions, different uh, illnesses uh, that we have a baseline number and what we saw early in the spring and then during the peak of COVID and then later COVID. And you can go down almost every single one of these measures and see that uh, early on there, there, there may have been a an increase in sepsis because a lot of these patients were presenting with signs of sepsis, but uh, during the peak, sepsis patients dropped, uh, true, true sepsis patients, uh, heart failure dropped significantly, MIs, as we just mentioned, heart attacks dropped down significantly, strokes, uh, pneumonia went up, rightly so, since 
COVID, uh, one of the major symptoms is pneumonia. Uh, di diabetic patients uh, were and still are disproportionately affected by COVID. So early on there was a bump, but even uh, the routine diabetic patients weren't coming for care. Uh, biliary tract disease, epilepsy, uh, you name it, acute kidney failure, everything here uh, essentially dropped down and vanished from, from the hospital. Uh, and it, it scared a, a lot of us in the medical profession uh, since patients weren't seeking care, they were suffering at home, uh, and as such would present with late symptoms. Uh, here's an article from CNN, drop in non-coronavirus hospitalization suggests people are skipping key medical care. And one of the key medical cares, routine general health maintenance, is cancer screening. And we'll, we'll see what happened with uh, cancer screening results. Uh, interestingly, uh, one thing that we did see uh, more than our usual uh, share were amputations. Uh, in fact, our one of our vascular surgeons often would comment about he's, they had never done more uh, amputations during a time period ever in their career. And uh, this was because diabetic patients weren't presenting with earlier in their disease with ulcers, uh, open lesions that may have been uh, prevented and treated, and instead staying at home, uh, reluctant to come in, and finally coming in when it was really too late to salvage a limb and uh, had had to undergo a, a foot amputation. So we saw a spike in uh, amputations. How about cancer care? What happened during COVID and uh, cancer care? Uh, here's an article uh, from the Wall Street Journal just last month about COVID outbreaks leads to dangerous delay in cancer diagnoses. Uh, you can see here the the headline is cancer doesn't take a pause. And that's certainly correct. That's one thing I wanna get across as a, as a take home message throughout this whole presentation is that don't delay your care. Hospitals are a safe place to come to, a lot of measures in place, and we need to keep up these routine uh, cancer screening methods that have been proven to save lives. And, and we'll show here uh, the impact of what a major disruption in routine screening has done and is projected to do. Some of the alarming signs that have come out of missing a lot of routine, think about colonoscopies, mammograms, pap smears. Uh, the National Cancer Institute here uh, estimates that of the missed screenings and other pandemic related impacts on care could result in about 10,000 additional deaths from breast and colon cancer alone over the next 10 years. So th this is not a short-term problem that uh, when the pandemic subsides and we have a vaccine and things get back to as normal as, as possible, that this is all gonna clear up and go away. Th there, there's gonna be lingering effects of this pandemic for several years to come and people are going to be studying it, writing about it. You're going to see a lot mentioned about this and how do we uh, patch what is essentially almost a, a year of, of disrupted care for many, many patients. Uh, here's another estimate. 18% of newly diagnosed breast cancer patients uh, are now presenting with an advanced stage versus 12% last year. This is uh, from 21st Century Oncology, which is a large radiation oncology group across the country. Quest Diagnostics, one of the major reference labs uh, nationally, uh, they have shown that the mean weekly new breast cancer diagnoses fell by more than 50% in March and early April of this year versus last year. Uh, previous to that, they had been slowly going up, and to see a, a fall of such magnitude is, is really shocking and, and significant. Uh, if that wasn't uh, bad news enough, more, more bad news. Uh, United Health saw mammograms drop by 95% in the second week of April versus last year. Uh, screenings began to resume later this summer, 
although they haven't returned to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the first eight months of 2020, almost there were, there were almost a million fewer mammograms across the country, colorectal and cervical cancer screenings combined, uh, versus the same time period last year. So that's that's a lot of patients who delayed care uh, that we have to deal with now and figure out how to safely get them back in the system and uh, catch up on missed screenings. Uh, Medicare estimates that biopsies for breast, lung, and cancer, uh, col colon cancer fell between 11% and 79% during, during the time period of, of the first surge. Here's another image from that same uh, JAMA article that I showed with non-cancer uh, care, how, how that dropped off significantly during the surge. Now, now let's take a look at, at cancer diagnoses. Uh, this graph uh, shows different, the major cancers that we, we uh, see here, breast cancer, colon, lung, pancreatic, gastric, esophageal. Uh, the color-coded uh, legend is right here on the right. And you can see virtually every cancer here dropped off quite significantly. The, the three big cancers that are the leading cancers in the U.S. and also the leading uh, cancer deaths uh, all saw significant drop-offs in the numbers of patients that were being diagnosed uh, throughout the pandemic. And that's something personally I saw as well. Uh, and it, it follows from not having mammograms. The mammogram, the screening is what finds an abnormality. It leads to a uh, perhaps additional imaging, a call back to the hospital. So patients weren't coming into the hospital to begin with. They certainly wouldn't be called, they wouldn't be in a position to have something identified to be called back uh, for additional imaging and subsequent biopsy, of which that is how we make a diagnosis of, of cancer. Uh, sa same thing with colonoscopy. Colonoscopies, routine uh, screening colonoscopies virtually drop dropped off the cliff. Uh, as such, we're not gonna diagnose colon cancer. Uh, the only way we'll diagnose colon cancer if we're not gonna screen for it is patients come in with symptoms, uh, bleeding, obstruction. And at, at that point, oftentimes the cancer has progressed and uh, now will present at a higher stage that may not be uh, potentially curable or may uh, have to be treated with additional therapies beyond just surgery. Um, same thing with lung cancer. Uh, pancreas uh, dropped off, but there's still an, an increase there, uh, gastric and esophageal. So how, how did pathology shift during the pandemic? What, what did we do differently? Uh, many uh, pathology departments across the country uh, shifted to digital pathology. So instead of the pathologist having to come to the hospital to look in a microscope at a slide, those facilities that had the capability could scan their slides and digitally uh, uh, transform it into an image that could then be reviewed remotely at home, somewhere else, over the internet, uh, and uh, signed out, diagnosed over, over a monitor rather than the microscope. This was something that has been uh, in the works for some time with pathology. Pathology uh, lags a bit behind radiology, where radiology shifted to uh, fully digital systems years ago. Uh, pathology uh, has has slowly been trending in that way, but there's a lot of advantages to the microscope. There's there's still some resistance in changing, and uh, the pandemic perhaps uh, pushed along that uh, progress some. In fact, the FDA uh, encouraged remote review of digital pathology slides during the pandemic. That was something the College of American Pathologists actively advocated for was to protect pathologists, uh, keep them at home if possible, and could they read cases remotely. Personally, we, we didn't have the capability to do this. 
uh, we, we did come to work. We still made diagnoses with, with our microscope here, uh, but we did rotate people, did not have a full department on most days. But uh, one side effect, I think, of the pandemic here for pathology is that it, it's going to push uh, further the uh, sea change that I think pathology will undergo in the not too distant future of changing from looking at glass slides under a microscope to reviewing them digitally. And here's just an image of how, how uh, the pathologists of the probably not so distant future might, their workspace might look. And you can see the, the glaring absence here is, is no, no microscope. So let's, let's look specifically at a breast cancer case and uh, look at how a breast cancer patient who's presenting with one of a common type of cancer, a, a common scenario, how they would have been approached, treated in the past, pre-COVID, and how they were treated uh, during COVID. And this was something that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in July uh, by uh, both the groups at MGH and Newton Wellesley here. Uh, this is a 62 year old woman with an early breast cancer that was diagnosed during, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, she found a three centimeter mass in the left breast, uh, did come in for care, fortunately. Uh, here are the images of the mammogram. Uh, you can see here in, in all of the uh, frames A, B, and C, a large mass that is what we call speculated, kind of has these sunburst uh, projections. It's a very worrisome radiographic sign for an invasive cancer. And here's an ultrasound image where the, uh, the, the mass has a uh, dark appearance. Uh, the patient uh, will then go for a needle biopsy at this time. Uh, a stereotactic core biopsy, which under guidance, uh, a needle is inserted into the mass, a sample of tissue is, is taken out. And if many of you had participated in my talk last year, I gave an introduction of how pathologists uh, will then receive that tissue, how we turn that into a glass slide and stain it. And then it's something that we will look under the microscope and make a diagnosis. So the top panel here is an uh, 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 image of her cancer. Uh, these groups of cells here are tumor cells. There's no normal breast tissue in this field. And this is a typical invasive ductal carcinoma. We call it a ductal carcinoma because it's trying to recapitulate the normal breast ducts. Uh, and this is in contrast to the other major type of breast cancer, which is a lobular. Uh, they, they both are breast cancers, but uh, we uh, distinctly classify them differently un under the microscope, uh, but they're together considered breast cancer. This one is, is a uh, ductal cancer, and uh, this is what's called a hematoxylin and eosin stain. It's a stain that we use all day uh, in, in a pathology department across the country. Uh, it stains the nuclei of cells, which are the dark brown structures here, the, the so-called brain of the cell, and the rest of the cell material takes on a, a pinkish reddish appearance, and that's the eosin of, of the stain. Now we can swap out that H and E, the hematoxylin eosin, and substitute antibodies. Uh, in this case, we have an antibody for estrogen. Uh, so instead of developing a reaction here that has shades of purples and pinks, now we're looking at browns, and brown is positive. Estrogen is a receptor that's found in the nucleus of cells. It drives cell growth. Breast cancers are often estrogen positive. They thrive on estrogen, so they will typically have uh, increased expression of estrogen. And this is manifested here in, in this picture where you can see 
the brown stain is localized to the nuclei of the cells and quite intense. So this would be diagnosed as a estrogen receptor, ER positive, invasive ductal carcinoma. The other marker that we look at, in addition to the hormone markers, uh, estrogen and progesterone, is HER2. Uh, HER2 is another receptor located on the cells that uh, also drives cell growth, and there is a small subset of breast cancers that will be HER2 positive. I didn't include an image here. Uh, she was HER2 negative, which is the more common of the scenarios, but uh, perhaps 20 to 30 percent of breast cancers could be HER2 positive, and that opens up an entirely different uh, 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 algorithm of therapy that we'll, we'll touch upon in, in the next slides. But if, if we look at an ER positive uh, breast cancer, HER2 negative, that's, that's one of the most common ones we see. Uh, before COVID, the breast cancer team would come together in what we call a multidisciplinary conference. Uh, that's attended by all members of the care team. Whether you directly see them or not, they are there discussing the, the patient. Uh, there's an oncologist who leads the discussion, as well as surgery, radiation oncologists, pathologists like myself will, will present the glass slides, show the pathology to the group. Uh, radiologist will show the images, they'll show the mammogram, ultrasound, MRI, any other pertinent, per pertinent uh, imaging uh, studies that will help frame the discussion. Uh, nursing and other uh, ancillary support services. And during that collaborative discussion, a treatment plan is, is developed uh, and put into place. And uh, that's, that's how we did things for, for decades. And uh, the way we diagnose a breast cancer uh, and then one of the things we decide on at this conference is, is how advanced is a breast cancer? Is it an early, is it a, a later breast cancer? And, and, and that depends on the staging. And the staging takes into account both factors that I see under the microscope and I will report on in my pathology report, as well as the clinical findings that the other clinicians on the team will, will report on. And the staging system that we use, many of you may have heard of, is called the TMN staging. And, and what that means is there are criteria that we look at for the tumor, uh, and each organ system has its distinct staging classification rules. These are the rules for, for breast cancer. Um, I just put it up here for illustration purposes so that uh, you'll see a T1 lesion might be uh, something that has this size, but if you go up to a T2 or a T1B, it's a little bit larger, T1C a little bit larger, a T2 still larger. So in general, the larger the number after the letter, the uh, more advanced the tumor is, whether it's a larger tumor uh, in the case of breast cancer or for colon cancer, it, the T stage is actually defined by how deep the tumor invades. Uh, not, not on the size. So each organ, as I mentioned, has its unique rules for, for creating a stage. The uh, N stage is based on lymph nodes, that's N as in Nancy, whether there are positive lymph nodes or negative lymph nodes. And then the M stands for metastasis, and that's whether one has documented disease outside of the breast. Is there something concerning in the bone, the liver, or the brain, elsewhere within the body? And what, what we do is we take, take that and uh, using the chart based on the T, the N, and the M, figure out what, what clinical stage a patient may be. They could be a stage 1A, a stage 1B, 1A, a, a 2A, et cetera. And this really drives the, the treatment. Uh, is the patient a candidate for surgery alone? Uh, is there a role for uh, chemotherapy? radiation after surgery or even before surgery, uh, which, which we call neoadjuvant, meaning we give treatment before we take a tumor out in the hopes that we can shrink the tumor, 
make it more amenable to surgery and hopefully have negative margins get get the entire tumor out. Uh, so these these were the treatment options that would be discussed: uh, upfront surgery, followed by adjuvant, meaning after surgery. Uh, there'd be some consideration for endocrine therapy, meaning if the tumor was estrogen positive, a person might go on tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, there might be adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, radiation, or both. And this was all actively discussed in this collaborative environment where, where we came together on a weekly basis to discuss new patients. Uh, COVID changed everything, as many of you are well aware of about how your own business has changed, everything uh, went, went virtual. So the new tumor board or multidisciplinary conference is now Zoom driven, just as uh, many of you may have virtual appointments with, with your physicians on, on Zoom platform. Uh, we, we do the same thing here at the hospital among the multidisciplinary team. So the radiologist, the oncologist, the surgeon, the pathologist, uh, radiation oncology, nursing, everybody comes together on the Zoom platform and does essentially the same thing as we did meeting together. Uh, really, uh, we, we've discovered that it's, it's a useful platform. Uh, I think one of the things I've seen come out of it is that there, there's actually uh, in, uh, the opportunity for greater involvement. Uh, many of these conferences now uh, can easily be attended by people from geographically di different areas. So, for instance, here at Newton Wellesley, we'll commonly have people call in from Mass General downtown, uh, and our attendance has has skyrocketed because of that. And one could argue that 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 actually creates better care. We have more people weighing in on on a patient's care. The this is a figure taken from that New England Journal article, and it uh, maps out how things changed with COVID. Uh, we would make a diagnosis of an early breast cancer. We would meet to discuss how that breast cancer should be managed. And the big uh, break point here in the algorithm and something we shifted towards that I, I want to get into a little bit about is uh, instead of virtually always surgery up front was being offered for patients before COVID, a significant number now were put on hold. They had delayed surgery, uh, but in the uh, during the delay, they were put on some sort of form of neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, and that therapy would be continued. Patient was closely monitored, watched for any progression. Uh, if there wasn't any progression, they'd, they'd complete the course of neoadjuvant and then go on to surgery. Uh, some patients did, though, require upfront surgery. Uh, a decision would have to be made about whether surgery was possible during the, the pandemic, whether uh, it, it was safe. Remember, we have to have a safe environment for not only the patient, but the the care team, the surgery, the, the surgery team, the OR, uh, was it something that the uh, risks outweighed the benefit and could we uh, safely proceed with surgery and uh, or could, should that uh, patient's surgery be delayed? And many of you may be thinking, well, make a diagnosis of cancer, what, we should really get it out first, the way to get it out is surgery. Is it even safe to delay a patient's surgery? And there is a lot of evidence out there in the literature that yes, it is safe for a short time period. Uh, when one combines neoadjuvant, meaning treatment upfront, endocrine treatment, either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor that uh, battles that estrogen receptor and, and really puts the brakes on the tumor growth uh, it's been shown to improve, improve surgical outcomes by actually increasing the eligibility of patients to undergo breast conserving therapy and uh, have negative margins and increase response rates. Uh, the risk of disease progression while a patient is receiving uh, therapy during a delayed surgery is actually very low. 
and I'll show some data to, to support that. One of the things that we have always done uh, during a breast cancer diagnosis and discussion of care is a, a lot of discussion went into, uh, will this patient need chemotherapy after surgery? That, and one of the uh, tests that we would send off is something called Oncotype VX. And we would send that off uh, to look for a score. And a score, it's a test that looks at a number of genes that are uh, growth type genes, uh, estrogen, other receptor genes that will give us a signature of that cancer, of its, of its probability of progressing, of having distant disease at a fixed amount of time. And if that patient had a low score, then one could reasonably uh, say uh, that that patient did not need chemotherapy after their surgery and, and that it was safe not to give 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 such. Uh, during COVID, things shifted a bit. And this Oncotype DX, which was traditionally done after surgery on a resected breast specimen to make that decision about did the patient need further treatment, now we were doing this on the needle biopsy up front before surgery. And using that as another piece of evidence an, an, another data point in our algorithm to decide, uh, w w is it worthwhile? Could, could this patient benefit from getting uh, therapy before surgery? Uh, here's a, a study, a uh, recent study that actually showed that if you uh, uh, had a low score, that's the RS down here, recurrent score of under 18, that you really had an insignificant risk of progression of, of your tumor, so less than 1%. So those patients who had an Oncotype DX of under 18 could safely be managed with endocrine therapy uh, and having their surgery delayed until things were safer to return back to the OR and to the hospital and uh, to assemble the care teams. Uh, as that recurrence risk got higher, there's a there's an increased risk of uh, having disease progress while a patient was awaiting surgery. So this is one piece of optimistic uh, data that was used in our discussions about how a patient should be managed during during COVID. Uh, out of this score and many other factors, which I'll show you here, uh, a, a a patient could have a score calculated that that was based on the tumor diagnosis, uh, other patient and tumor factors that were in the pathology report, how acute the disease process was. Is this something that's uh, fulminant, that's really progressing uh, clinically with a rapid course, or if it seems that this is a slow, slow process? Uh, what sort of availability did we have for non-surgical treatments and how long surgery had been delayed. Uh, this is the algorithm. Uh, I just wanted to show it to, for, for you to get a sense of uh, the complexity of the decision-making process and really the, the care that was taken for each patient, each and every patient during the pandemic to decide whether the patient who was newly diagnosed with cancer, whether they could be safely put on uh, uh, chemotherapy or some form of endocrine therapy before surgery. And based on the score that was developed, whether uh, what, when, when surgery should be uh, attempted. So we, we had a backlog of patients. And as we came out of the pandemic, everybody uh, had a score calculated and we uh, attempted to triage the patients and uh, then schedule them based on their score of who really needed the surgery sooner than somebody else that was doing well or actually uh, uh, showing good good response rates on the uh, endocrine or uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, MGH had created this uh, risk 
calculator that online these data points could be put in uh, and a score was then calculated and that was factored into that algorithm that I showed you on the prior screen of uh, how soon a patient could uh, come come back for, for surgery. This is a chart from that New England Journal article uh, and the, the take home points here, uh, typical management before COVID generally involved upfront surgery followed by some form of therapy afterwards, whether it was endocrine therapy or chemotherapy. And that was really the case for newly diagnosed postmenopausal early breast cancer that was hormone positive, HER2 negative, uh, even newly diagnosed premenopausal cancers, uh, newly diagnosed uh, HER2 amplified, uh, early stage with still surgery, uh, later stage HER2, as I remember, recall when we talked about HER2, those patients would get neoadjuvant upfront and then surgery. Uh, and this category of uh, triple negative cancers, which many of you may have heard, and that refers to patients who have no estrogen responsive uh, receptors in their tumor, no progesterone receptors, and no HER2 activity. Uh, so those, those patients have much more limited therapy options, they too had upfront surgery. Uh, how, how did COVID change it? Many of these patients were put on endocrine therapy upfront, followed by delayed surgery uh, with the logic of the algorithm I, I showed on the previous slides. Then following, uh, you can see pretty much every category, neoadjuvant therapy followed by surgery, uh, right, right down through the list. So that's that's the major change that COVID uh, created here. It threw us a curveball. Uh, we were able to respond to it using what we knew in the literature and were able to safely delay surgery in uh, a, a significant number of patients. So what about radiation? What about patients who were receiving radiation or who needed radiation up front or part of their care during COVID. That too had a lot of uh, data to support modified radiation schemes of one could make a case for admitting radiation in some patients, uh, even delaying it like we did surgery or shortening the course. Uh, radiation, you know, is a very uh, intensive uh, therapy. It typically involves patients coming to the hospital every day for several weeks. Uh, and you can imagine the dilemma that caused with COVID, trying to re-coordinate uh, patient schedules, either uh, devising new therapy plans that divided the dose of radiation over a different time period so patients wouldn't have to come back as much, uh, or even delaying uh, radiation. What, what happened at Newton Wellesley and MGH? Uh, at Newton Wellesley, we, we had 77 patients who uh, had delayed surgery that after the pandemic, we, we brought them back, uh, triaged them according to the algorithm and, and operated on them. And MGH had 270. Uh, that, that number does include a significant number of the Newton Wellesley patients. So there, there were a lot of patients who, who were affected by uh, COVID who already had breast cancer, let alone those who we haven't diagnosed yet. And that's something I, I, I want to talk about next. So where where do we go from here? What, what are the uh, next steps? Uh, this is some data that was presented last, last month at the European Breast Cancer Conference. Uh, it showed that uh, there were some significant effects on breast cancer screening and treatment. Uh, what we found here that was presented is that a six month delay is likely gonna lead to increased breast cancer death rates in, in the coming years. Uh, the best way to prevent deaths, they, they modeled how could we get back on track uh, with different scenarios of one, getting everybody 
back on their scheduled uh, screening routine, uh, trying to make up for lost ground, would is is the system even uh, equipped to handle the the backlog? Uh, another option would be to restart breast screening as normal after the delay, but shift the endpoint, meaning uh, shift when you stop doing screening. So essentially, push the whole uh, mammogram screening process forward six months or or a year. Uh, the the best way they found to prevent an excess of deaths from breast cancer is to catch up with all the screening that was missed. But again, as I described, that that's tough. And that's something that I think each, each uh, medical system, each state, each country across the world is going to have to figure out how do they catch up with, with this backlog and how do they manage it going forward. Uh, the conference did present uh, similar results for cervical and colorectal cancer, uh, showing that that too uh, had similar patterns of uh, likely increased uh, death rates and we would have to come up with strategies of how to re revisit all those patients in the backlog and establish new screening protocols going forward. I'd like to end here. The, next couple slides. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, COVID-19 Breast Cancer Consortium Consideration for Reentry. This is a uh, paper that was written by experts from across all medical disciplines, radiology, surgery, oncology, that really set the framework for how we dealt with breast cancer during COVID. And we learned a lot during COVID, we're still learning some. And I think this, this paragraph, I just wanted to read it because it really drives home a lot of important points. And it, it violates one of the rules of a PowerPoint presentation of have, is having too many words on the screen. But I think this one's important to actually listen to what's being said here. So I'll, if you bear with me, I'll just read through it. So COVID-19 has transformed the way we practice medicine. We're using more telemedicine reducing the number of patient visits and being more efficient with resources. Clinicians are striving to deliver more care in an outpatient setting and delay or even eliminate tests and treatments while avoiding compromising patient outcomes. Many of these practices may be shown to improve the value of our care due to decreased costs and improved efficiencies and will become the standard even in a post COVID world. We must take extra care, however, to ensure that the populations most affected by COVID, including those in underserved areas and the elderly in particular, are included in our modified practice patterns. Time and careful documentation will tell, tell us if outcomes and patient experience are compromised because of the altered treatment patterns that have emerged out of necessity during this pandemic. So the, the story is not yet over. Uh, the, the book is not closed on uh, the effect that COVID has dealt us. Uh, time is going to tell. There's going to be a lot of data collection over the months and years. People studying this, looking back of how this really impacted care. Uh, we did learn a lot. Hopefully, uh, what we learned will be translated into better ways to deliver care in, in the new post-COVID world. And one final slide I'd like to end here is that there, there is hope. Um, there's always hope, even during the worst of times during the pandemic, we continue to treat patients in a safe and effective way and uh, encourage patients to come back to the hospital, to come back for routine care, routine cancer screening, because we wanna continue to keep you well uh, this is a, a bell that's in the uh, atrium of the cancer center next door here at, at the hospital. Uh, it says, ring this bell three times well. It's toll will clearly say my treatments are done. This course has run and now I'm on my way. Each, each patient who finishes their treatment here uh, rings that bell on their last visit. And it's a very uh, joyous moment. And it's, it's a sound that everybody cherishes and we hope to continue 
uh, to here in the years to come, no matter what happens with COVID. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, listening. Uh, if any of you have questions, uh, I'd be happy to uh, field a few if you want to think you have the capability to uh, send them to Michelle. Yes, and we are getting a few questions. So thank you so much. Let me dive in here. Um, first question is, do you foresee any advantages or disadvantages to pathology moving to the digital format you were describing? Uh, yes. So the advantage is that cases, number one, can be reviewed remotely such that nobody but ever had expected a pandemic. Uh, a, a lot of work was on, underway for many years before the pandemic to try and transition pathology to digital. And I don't think anybody even thought about how like one of the case uh, case study, uh, case ar arguments for digital pathology would be what if a pandemic hit? Well, this is exactly a, a, a case use for it. Um, the other nice thing about digital pathology is the ability to share more easily cases across uh, geographies, across the country, across the globe in a real-time manner. Uh, right now, the vast majority of the pathology world still operates on glass slides. So, for instance, if a patient is diagnosed at one institution, wants to go for treatment or a second opinion at another institution, usually those slides are packaged up, shipped off. If there's a time delay, it goes through regular mail. Uh, the other department gets the slides, reviews them. Well, imagine if uh, those images were stored in the cloud and easily accessible to anybody. Uh, that patient could be seen a second opinion could be given virtually instantly after after the first diagnosis. Uh, that body of uh, data up there in the cloud would be available for anybody uh, during tumor board conferences. We, we could pull that down, show it in real time versus static images of slides on, on a microscope. Um, downside of digital right now is the cost. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of data that's required to store the amount of information on a slide, the number of pixels, in order to create a good resolution that equals that of a microscope. Uh, it's, it's really terabytes of information per slide. So imagine uh, here, here, and I'll just use, for instance, in pathology department here, we may have five to 600 slides a day being made. Now, imagine five or 600 terabytes of information. That's, that's a lot of information. Uh, people are going to have to decide what's important, what's not important to digitally store, the, the cost of storing that, uh, So those, and just the cost of the equipment that we need to have in pathology departments to scan it. It's not something that's routine right now. It is a uh, significant cost hurdle currently until the price comes down. Uh, what made it an easier argument for radiology was that it actually eliminated a step. The radiologist did not have uh, films anymore that you could hold and, and look at. It just went straight to digital. In pathology, we're still going to be making the last slide because that's what we're going to use to scan. So. We're, we're not going to be eliminating a, a step. We still have to make the glass slide. So there are those out there who say, well, we're still making the glass slide. Let's keep on looking at the glass slide. So I, I think those conversations are going to continue for some time, but obviously with a new uh, flair for what we've learned with COVID and actually what, what the FDA has now uh, expedited the approval for making remote diagnoses, which was another uh, barrier. Uh, thus far, was was there even regulatory approval to do this remotely? And right now, yes, that's one of the obstacles that that's uh, gotten rid of. Thank you. Um, has the 
side effects of breast cancer treatment, particularly from endocrine therapy, put patients at greater risk for developing complications due to COVID infection. Um, for example, increased weight gain and risk of developing AFib. Not that I'm aware of, um, although I would defer that question to my clinical colleagues and I could uh, dive into that deeper and, and get back to that question if you, if you want to capture who sent that in, Michelle, but not, not that I'm aware of. It, as, as I mentioned, it, it has been uh, safe. Uh, we've not seen progression of cancer of their disease, uh, but we haven't seen uh, a, an, an increased uh, susceptibility to COVID because of those uh, side effects. Okay, thank you. And I do have one more for you. Um, I know it's early in, in, the, in where we are on this timeline, but do you foresee cancer care management ever returning to the pre-COVID approach? I think uh, the short answer is no. I think it's going to return to a hybrid. Uh, there are certainly new innovative uh, ways of approaching care, delivering care that we've learned because of the pandemic that were on their way to being implemented with virtual visits and such. Uh, COVID expedited that. I think that's going to be the quote new normal for a, a lot of care going forward. Uh, so we're going to pull out definitely the pearls that we learned that have worked well during COVID and I think apply those going forward. For instance, a, a Zoom platform for multidisciplinary conference, I, I think that's going to continue for a long time. Uh, it's, it's worked well, as I mentioned earlier, it, it has increased access to experts weighing in, getting opinions, uh, things like that. And I think as there's a shift in general to more outpatient care, trying to keep people out of hospitals. Uh, there definitely have been strategies that were effective during COVID that are going to be utilized going forward for that as well. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, I think that was our final question. So Dr. Misalek, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Cheryl Osimo, our executive director at NBCC, as long with our board of directors. I thank you for taking the time to be with us today and to share this information. I think you've given um, everyone a lot of valuable information and insight into cancer care moving forward. Um, and I want to thank all of our many listeners for joining us today. For those who are interested in the recording of this webinar, uh, it should be available later this afternoon on the NBCC website at NBCC.org. And uh, I want to wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you, everybody.